Hi, Adobe community. Welcome back to Adobe Live. I'm your host today, Clara Galan. I'm new to the Adobe Live team, and I'm on my very first Adobe Live stream coming to you live from Barcelona. If you're tuning in to YouTube, please join us in the chat on behance.net slash live. That's behance.net slash live. And we are live. So if you have questions, comments, want to participate in the general conversation, please go ahead and post them in the chat and we'll get to your questions today. But today I'm very excited to be joined by an incredible colleague and Adobe expert, Bart van der Wiele, who focuses on manager solutions consulting and is based in Europe in Belgium. He's also the author of Adobe Photoshop, Illustrator, Collaboration Workflow, which is part of the Classroom in a Book series. And we're gonna be sharing a sneak peek of some of the workflows you can get in this book and have all of your questions answered live. So Bart, thanks so much for joining us today. How are you? Hi, Clara. I'm good. Thank you. Great introduction. Thank you. By the way, it was, uh, was good. Thanks for that. Yes. Is there anything else I missed? Anything else you'd like to share about your background with the Adobe Live community? Uh, well, let me think here. So uh, so I've been in the industry for about 21 years now. Um, mm -hmm. I started out as a graphic designer a good couple of years ago, and um, I turned into a trainer, so Adobe trainer. So I worked with a lot of companies and businesses and other designers. I worked on a lot of my customers' files as well, from which I learned a lot. And then I joined Adobe about seven and a half years ago as a solution consultant. A solution consultant is basically a, um, a job description. Uh, it's um, It basically means that you specialize in one or more Adobe solutions, and then you sit down and talk with customers about the value of that solution uh, just to kind of help solve their issues, problems, workflows. That's uh, what that basically means. And so, yeah, and as you said, I've been managing a team for the last year now, so I have seven amazing solution consultants who all specialize in different solutions. So it's, uh, it's, it's neat. I, I learn a lot. And it's great to reconnect. I know we met in person for the first time in Belgium a few years ago at a, yeah, at a Bump a Festival years. conference. <laughs> Correct, um, yeah. So it's great to be reconnected here on Adobe Live. And um, I know you have this incredible book that just came out. I was um, learning a little bit more about it and I'm excited to see some more of those workflows. But share, like, what inspired you to um, write this book and share it with the community? Um, that's a good question. So... Look, the thing is, like, if, if you're working as a graphic designer, like it doesn't really matter if you're if you're working as a print designer or if this is more illustration or or, or desktop publishing. Look, when you're using a combination of Photoshop, InDesign, Illustrator, and not even all three, even if it's just like like two of those apps, whichever combination that you you like best, there are certain practices where you place one file and you place it, or you link it, or you embed it, or you copy and paste basically content from one app into the other. This is something that we do every day, right? But the thing is that there are certain best practices. Like, let's say, for example, you open up an Illustrator document and um, and you notice the file is a bit sluggish. Like, why is it, why is the file so slow? Why doesn't it refresh so slow? And you got this file from somebody else and you look at the links panel and you notice like the, somebody apparently thought it was a great idea to embed a 600 megabyte Photoshop document. But you're going to say, who thought it was a good idea? To, you know, that is the thing. So. We know there are certain techniques about, mm -hmm. yes, you can place and you can link and you can copy and embed and all that kind of stuff, but there are consequences to those choices. And so everyone here, so myself and designers and trainers and, and you know presenters around the world, like we all know that you have to think before you make those steps. What is it that needs to go into which application? And do you want to go back and make changes to this? Are you anticipating changes? Are you collaborating with others? So there's a lot of stuff out there. Mm -hmm. But in, in my in my research, there was no one stop shop where all these rules of engagements were basically documented. Like if you want to embed a file, let's take that 600 megabyte Photoshop file in Illustrator. Would that be a good idea? Yes or no? So we basically stop and ask a couple of questions like how big is the file? Like, do you have to work with others? Like, do you want to go back and, and change it? Like, what are the possible repercussions uh, both from a technical and a creative point of view before you take that action. And that is what the book's about. So I just figured, you know, uh, unless of, you know, and, instead of just taking, you know, f snippets and bits and, and bobs here from, from different help documents, let's just build uh, a guide, a manual that just talks about best practices based on real life examples. That That's the scope of the book. And I think that will hopefully help fill a certain gap for certain designers where they're not quite sure which method to take. Do they work with layers? Do they work with artboards? Like what's the difference? And when what's the tipping point? When, when do you go from one technique to the other? And that's what the book's about. So I'm hoping it's going to make a lot of designers' lives easier out there. That's the main goal. 
Yeah, it sounds like it just across the board and being able to see these different workflows. And, you know, if you're not quite sure, having that extra um, set of expertise um, to be able to dive right in. Um, so speaking of that, you know, I'd love to get a sneak peek into what are some of the, the features in the book? What are some of the different workflows? Um, you know, I know the community will be able to review the book at length, but would love to dive in to just get a sneak peek. Yeah, sure. Um, so basically, what we do is, so in every single chapter, we take a certain um, app combination. So let's mm -hmm. say going from Illustrator to, to Photoshop or going from Photoshop to InDesign or maybe from Illustrator to InDesign or maybe things that you might not expect, like going from InDesign to Photoshop, like why would you do this? But there are many advantages there as well. And so every chapter is basically a different combination. So what I can do here, if you like, is I can just take a couple of examples of, of these techniques. Now, these files don't literally come from the book, but there's the exact same techniques here. So I'm happy to share just a couple of pointers here and there if, if, if that'll be okay. Yeah, that sounds great. Would love to dive in. And I'm just going back to the chat here as well um, to see if there are any um, comments. I know we have some folks from the community joining. Nice to see you, Sandrine and Andreas. Um, welcome. So if you are watching in YouTube again, um, pop on over to behance.net slash live and we can answer any of your questions um, in the chat. But with that, Bart, I'll hand it off to you to start diving into some of these uh, workflows. Okay, cool. Thanks. So look, I'm just going to take a couple of examples here, right? So if you have any um, any, any requests, any questions, obviously just, again, just put them in the chat and then Clara can read them out for me. Uh, I'm just going to go over just a couple of very basic scenarios that I'm sure we've all come across. And if it's not you, it is that one coworker in the office who might be working this way because he or she believes this is the only way to do, think, to do things. But that's kind of thing. There is there is there are recommendations in these workflows. There's no one size fits all for every single situation. And that's why you kind of have to think what is it that you want to do and, and how are you anticipating this workflow uh, to, to continue? So just a very, very basic example, just to kind of get started. So here in InDesign, so let's just say I'm working on this brochure here in InDesign and I have three different icons here. These icons come from Illustrator. So um, in this specific scenario, these icons are separate documents, they're separate files which is fine. So there's technically, there's nothing wrong with this. Okay, so let's take a look at these files here. Now, just, just so you know, just a quick tip here, if you just select a graphic in uh, InDesign, if you press and hold down the Alt or Option key and then click the link icon, it will actually open up the links panel and select the link here in the links panel. Just a quick quick tip here, a um, little extra. So here I can clearly see that there are three different icons. There's one here, it says uh, icon biometrics, white.ai, I've got this one, I've got that one. And these are three separate files. Now, is there anything wrong with that? Nope, nothing wrong with that. However, what if you are anticipating a change in color or a change in stroke weight or whatever it might be? Then that would mean that I would have to first open up this one, make those changes. For example, change the color. Again, something very basic. Maybe this should be like this greenish color or a bit, a bit, a bit of a yellow color. And then I would have to replicate those steps here and then here and then maybe if this series of icons is longer i would have to do this multiple times and then obviously i would have another issue because the the file name says icon biometrics white right so if i turn this into a yellow icon i would have to go back and change the name of the file to yellow which also is a lot more work because if you're you're a bit like me then this should no longer say what it should say yellow then you have to change the link to yellow but then you have to relink it here but maybe you were using the same icon linked in Photoshop. So now you have a broken link in Photoshop. So anyway, it's, you just <laughs> want it. That's the thing, you know? So you kind of go down that rabbit hole and that is the thing, that's the problem. So what can we do to, 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 to do this all over, right? So what can we do? So the thing is, what if you just put the icons in one, uh, one Illustrator file instead? So not one separate file, just all, in this case, four icons all together. OK, so what a lot of people would do is they would say, you know what, this is the first icon and maybe they want to have like a bit, a bit of a guide here, just a bit, a bit of a padding uh, going on here. And then obviously uh, they would take this one file. So imagine these are these guys are not here. They're not here, right? They're not there. So imagine I just have one here. They would just make the first one. And because they want to uh, create, create or have three or four other icons with the same artboard size and the same guide, they would use file, save as, and then save it, type, 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 different name, and then redo it. Anyway, 
this is not really necessary. So like if you have any shapes, anything you want, like a, a guide or whatever it is that you want, you want to basically um, use here. So again, just for guide, it's very simple. In Illustrator, you can use any symbol, any any shape you want. Like say I'm just gonna just uh, draw a basic rectangle here. And you right click it and you basically say here that you want to make turn this into a guide. Now it's gonna snap, you know, it's just gonna act like a regular guide. Now, if you cut this and then choose edit paste on all artboards, bang, you have it on all artboards. So you don't have to do this three or four times. Oh, you want to change the color. Well, that's the advantage of having the artboards here. If you were to go ahead and just double click this swatch, which is a global swatch. What does that mean? Global? Global means you can just go ahead and change the color and every single swatch that uses that color is going to, is going to have that update. So changing that those white icons to yellow would have been easier this way, right? So the mm -hmm. thing is, if I now go ahead and just save this for a second, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to choose file save as, I'm just gonna choose a generic name. I'm gonna say all swatches, and I'm gonna just do it .ai because I might go back and change the color afterwards. And I'm just gonna save this here to my desktop for a second. Actually, I'm gonna save this here in the Adobe Live folder. So the thing is, I'm gonna choose, okay, if I were to go back to InDesign now, and if I were to just hit the place command, so again, it's command D or control D on PC, go back to the Adobe Live folder, there's all swatches. There is a show import options um, checkbox, choose open and now you have access to all of these different icons so for example if i am looking nice. for let's say the first one like this one here there's number one i need number two and number four well you simply say i want number one two and four and you choose okay and now you've got your cursor loaded with these different icons here and now it's just a matter of replacing these now if you're just going to click here it's just going to place it on top it's not really putting it into this existing uh, frame. However, if you hold down the Alt or Option key, you just go ahead and replace it immediately from here as well. Just Alt click, Alt click, Alt click, and you have a replacement. That's kind of easy thing because now you can see that you have this AI file. You've got all these um, icons here and it's actually showing you which artboard was active. If you see no number, that means the first, the first artboard. This is the second artboard. This was the fourth artboard. You do have control over this. Now, there's another advantage to this workflow as opposed to having separate icons and replace, replacing them one by one. And that is if I were to create a package by choosing file package because I want to send this to a coworker or a printer or a freelancer or basically back up the entire project, because I did, I did not place in this third icon, see it's not there, that third icon would have been lost if I had separate icons because it was not referenced anywhere. Now there's only one file that needs to be included in the package, which is this file, which holds all of the icons. You will not lose that work either. So for those various reasons, this is just a very simple example of how this workflow can be improved and you can avoid so many different headaches just by putting in a little bit of extra effort as you build the file so you can take advantage of, of, all, of all these icons as you go along. Again, just one fun basic example here. Now let's, um, Let's keep going. If there are questions, uh, obviously yeah. just, uh, just let we, me know. We have, um, Angus says, uh, wow, that's nice. And it's definitely so much of an easier workflow um, than the previous you were sharing. So um, again, if anyone has any questions, go ahead and, and share them in the chat. Cool. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that, Angus. Oh, and just one more thing here. If you are like, well, you know, I now have four icons in one file, but my customer or whoever might need to have the second and the fourth one separately. So now I have to go and select and copy it into a new file and paste it so I can send it separately. No, please stop doing that. So a couple of things. First of all, you can always just take the artwork that you have here, select it, and then using the asset export panel, just click this button here that says generate multiple assets. And then just basically choose which file format you want to export this to and then choose export. It will do it automatically for you. But if your argument is, yeah, but this needs to be an AI file. There's no AI in that list. That is also true. So what you can do then is simply choose file, save as, and then you choose to save it as an AI. And when you choose save, I'm just going to save separate to save. And from here, from the Illustrator save options, you can say, I'm gonna save each artboard to a separate file. You choose okay. And then it's gonna go ahead and generate all those different files for you. Let's take a look here. I did not name these artboards myself. So the names might be a little bit odd, uh, but as you can see here, they are, they're all separate as different AI files. So that's exactly what I was looking for. So there's still a way out. Okay, mm -hmm. basic example. Illustrator into InDesign. Okay. Now let's uh, let's take a look at, for example, Photoshop to InDesign. Let's take a different combination here, just a bit of a different 
uh, different path here. So um, this is, imagine this is an image I have uh, in preparation for a poster campaign for let's say travel company, travel agency. And so we have this uh, these images, all these images come from Adobe Stock by the way. Uh, and so we have a mountains image and I have a city image here as well. And there's a color overlay, which kind of changes the uh, the color of the little window shade here because I've got a brownish tint and a, a greenish tint and a bluish tint. Just I have all these crazy combinations. Now, in the end here in InDesign, let's just pick a different file here. Here we go. So here in InDesign, so I already have my posters good to go. I have two posters for this campaign. There's one, you know, the slogan is like island hopping and this one is city hopping. And I need to have like the appropriate graphic to put in that location here inside of Adobe InDesign. Now, going back here, I know that I have one version where I might want to have this, um, you know, this, this um, image of uh, Norway with uh, let's say bluish, uh, let, let's say like greenish uh, tint. And I might have a different version where I kind of want to focus on, let's say this area of the layer, which I kind of kind of like. And I might have a different version where I have the city instead and maybe have like a blue tint or maybe with or without this little glow effect, I'm not quite sure. So the thing is what a lot of people would do is they would probably just save this file as uh, poster, whatever, um, uh, city view.psd, and then they would just uh, hide the layer or delete it and say, and this is mountains image.psd, and bang, you've got two separate files. And that is the issue. So because these two separate files, they have an, they have an element in common, which is the window here uh, of the plane. So this means that if my customer now says, hey, we want to make a change here. So maybe it would be interesting if the, the window blind were to be closed a bit more, let's just say like, like up to here, more or less, then you have to do some Photoshop work. And then you have to replicate that work or duplicate the layers from this composition into the other file because you made a copy, right? You chose to have a copy and now you have two children that you have to take care of. So that is the issue. So what can we do? We're gonna take a look at something that has been around for a very, very long time. And this is, might, might be something for you guys to try and answer. So I'm gonna go ahead here, I'm gonna choose window. I'm gonna choose something called layer comps. Now, if anyone here in the chat can answer how long has layer comps been around and which Photoshop version did layer comps, uh, were layer comps launched? Which old Photoshop version? Just a quick question for you guys. And maybe uh, I have something special for whoever gets this answer right uh, first. So let's take a look here. So the first version would be something like this, right? So I would have this version here. I'm, I'm focusing on this little village and I want to have this little green overlay and I want to have, I want to have this outer glow effect as well. So with all these elements in place, I'm just going to go ahead and click the new layer comp button. And I'm going to call this one, let's call this one village or like Norway, let's say Norway, Nor Nor Norway. My daughter is called Nora. So I have a tendency to type Nora. So Norway version one. Um, and which features, like which attributes would you like to capture or record basically into this layer comp? So I want to take a look at the visibility. So which is which, uh, lay, which layers are active and inactive, um, the position of the layer. So this means, uh, where is the layer located on the canvas? So the actual X and Y coordinates. So here I'm focusing on this little village here. And I also want to take into account the appearance, so the layer style, because I want to play around with the outer glow effect. So these three parameters should be recorded, okay? Because I will change these parameters as I build the next version. So this could be, for example, uh, village view with glow and then say a like green overlay, whatever, just kind of make it like very descriptive. I'm gonna choose okay for now. There you go. I've just created my very first layer comp. Now let's change things up a little bit. I'm gonna say, you know what? I kind of focus on this version here, I am focusing on like fjords and mountains and stuff. And I don't want to have the outer glow effect. It's like a second version. I'll do this. Let's say more way V2, keep the same parameters. This is going to be, um, let's say mountain view, no glow, green overlay. Again, make it very descriptive. And then let's make the last one here. So let's say city view with the glow blue. This is kind of what I'm looking for here. Same thing. So this is going to be uh city v1 i only have one version but that's fine this is city view with glow and this is going to be the blue overlay then i'm going to choose okay now we have to save this so i'm going to go ahead i'm going to choose file i'm going to choose save as 
And I'm gonna save this here in the Adobe Live folder, travel ads, I'm gonna call this one layer comps. I do um, like adding the word layer comps in my file name because that way whoever comes across this file will know, oh, there are layer comps here. So they don't start messing around with layers because there is something here that can can get broken basically. So that's, that's the reason why. I'm gonna choose okay, I'll choose save, I'll choose okay. And now let's go back to Adobe InDesign. So in the normal workflow, you would have two separate Photoshop files, right? You would place Photoshop one here in this um, uh, graphics frame and then Photoshop file two in the other graphics frame. So what I can do here is I can just go ahead and just select this very first frame I'm going to choose File Place or Command D or Control D if you're a shortcut guy or gal. And I'm going to go ahead and just click the travel at layercoms.psd file. I have the import options still on. I tend to use them most of the time, to be honest. I'll choose Open. And now I could potentially mess around with the layers here, right? So this is something that I'm guessing a good portion of the Amazon users already know. You can override the layer visibility. You can say, I don't want the blue one, I want the brown one, et cetera, which is fine. However, there are two things here that I'm about to do that you cannot do by using these layer overrides. And that is, I cannot decide by clicking these eye icons in the layers list, I cannot decide where a layer is positioned. Remember the village versus the mountain. And I also cannot um, define or, or set the visibility of a layer style, which was my outer, outer glow effect. Remember that? That's exactly where layer comps come in. Look, I can go back to layer comps. Look, here they are. So for example, I might have Norway version two and I might have the city and these are all my different versions. So for example, this is city hopping. So this is what I need here. And this one here, I'm gonna do this exact same thing, hit command D. Let's do this here. And this one should be, for example, Norway version one, for example. So I can just go ahead and change here to a different view. There we go. And now I have these different versions good to go and they're all leading to the exact same Photoshop document. Now, if you want, you can always just right click an existing PSD file and then choose object layer options. And as you can see, I still have control here over the uh, different versions of this layer comp, which is kind of neat. And now I can just go ahead and choose whichever version I, I want to use. So again, this is like having multiple versions, like all consolidated into the exact same file. Um, if you take a look here at my links panel, just as an FYI here. So um, these are two instances, the same instance, same instances of the same file here. So I've got two times this file here uh, in this document. Now I have a column here that says, yes. Now, what does that mean? Yes. So this is an extra column that I added into my InDesign lay, uh, links panel myself. So the reason I did that is by clicking the panel menu and then choosing panel options. And here in this long list of options, there's a layer overrides option that I checked. Now what happens now is that here I get this little eye icon and it says, nope, this one did not have any layer overrides. This one does have layer overrides. So, because it just did change like more of the, how um, uh, um, should I put this? It changed which layers were visible or invisible um, uh, in that layer comp ever since I saved the file. So this can also help you identify some of these things in the same document as well, which is kind of neat. And the same thing, if you were to go ahead and make a package, there's only one file that needs to be uh, shared and you can always go back and then uh, alter or change that layer comp as you see fit. In the same scenario, like when I also ended that one exercise in, in Illustrator where you say, well, you know, maybe I do want to kind of split up the different versions after all, what do I do? Because I chose, I went down the layer comps uh, rabbit hole. So how do I get back out? So how do I go back into normal, well, normal? How do I split up these different layer comps into separate Photoshop files, okay? And this could be something that's interesting when you're sharing any file with anyone your coworker might say, hey, we want to use that city hopping version that you have uh, as a separate as a separate file. But you're thinking, well, you know, there's a layer comp and you have to activate the layer comp. And my my coworker, he's uh, he doesn't really know how that stuff works. Ugh, I have to kind of make it a bit more idiot proof. Let's just quickly make it simple. Just get rid of all the other layers. Well, let's be honest. So what can happen is what you do is you go here back into Photoshop. If you go to file, and then if you go here to, uh, give me a sec here, uh, batch connection, oh, I think it's here in um, the scripts, uh, layer comps, layer comps. I had it just a moment here. Uh, flatten layers, nope. Ah. 
exports. Here we go. Exports layer comps to files. Here we go. So if you choose layer comps to files, then you can just basically go ahead and you can say that you want to have different PSD files per layer comp. So in this case, I would be exporting one, two, three different Photoshop documents, each with mm -hmm. their different compositions. And then it's just a matter of cleaning out that file and removing anything you don't really need to sustain that layer comp and then send it off to someone else. So that's one thing you can do. Uh, there we go. And obviously when you send a PSD file, um, you don't have to send this using retransfer or whatever. You just save it as a cloud document now, obviously. And then you go ahead and click the share button and just directly share that with that other person uh, over the creative cloud. It's a lot easier because let's be honest, what happens with um, a lot of these file sharing um, systems that we tend to use, it's a large file, especially Photoshop, we send it off, Ugh, it's it's a bit too big, you know, and I might have to yeah. split this up into different transfers or it doesn't transfer well via email and you share the link and then the link's expired because someone's out on holiday and, you know. It happens to me all the time. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. You don't need a headache. So again, so save it as a cloud document, hit the share button, and then you can just um, send it through and you get notifications when they open up the file and they click OK and all that kind of stuff. So you do have a bit of control, which is kind of neat. So um, so yeah, those are the layer comps. That's there so helpful. Just so much more organized to just working across functionally in different teams. And the there's a lot of comments here in the chat too. And so Bart, I know you asked a question earlier. Yes. Um, do you want to repeat that re question one more time, and I'll give you some yep. of the answers from the chat. So okay. so a long time ago, um, layer comps was introduced in Photoshop. Which Photoshop version was that? So I'll I'll give you a hint. It was a CS version, Creative Suite. Yep. Which one? That is the question. So we have a couple answers in here. So a little trivia moment. Um, Stuart <laughs> guessed uh, CS5, Angus CS5. Let's, I'm going through here. Mm -hmm. um, Tim CS, potentially CS3. Um, let's see. I'm going to go through if there's anyone else. So those are, and then just some general comments. Uh, Dave says, I love layer comps. I actually learned a couple of tips from Bart's max classes in 2021 that I use all the time now. So. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Now I'm not quite sure what I'm supposed to say the answer. So <laughs> uh, the answer has been given. It has okay. been given. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can I? Second round of guessing. <laughs> Second round of guessing. No, I can just maybe just go ahead and say it. It was it was CS3, by the way. It was not CS3, which is I'm not quite sure when CS3 came out, but I'm guessing it's about 15 years ago or so. So this has been possible for 15 years. Uh, so that's a very long time, but it's one of those features that apparently is like forgotten in time. So but anyway, all fine. I'm here to refresh your memory. So uh I would say with that, let's just quickly keep going. Oh, by the way, nice. you can also use that same layer comp um if you place a PSD in Photoshop, if you nest a Photoshop file, or even when you embed the file in Illustrator, you can also choose a layer comps. So layer comps, there are multiple ways of using layer comps. It's actually really cool. So, um, so yeah, cool. So I put a lot of stuff in InDesign. Let's put some stuff in Photoshop now. Okay, I think that's something that we all tend to do. So let's take a look at a different design. Uh, let's take a look at this one here, for example. I'm not gonna do color management today. It's just not one of those days. Um, there we go. So let's take a look at this file here. It's a, it's a web page mockup, and you know I just chose a web page just to kind of change things up a little bit. But obviously, you can just choose any type of project that you want for this uh, particular use case here. So a um, couple of things. So let's open up a couple of things here inside of Adobe Illustrator. Now, logos. So I have a file, three artboards, three logos. Um, is it normal to have multiple color versions of a logo in the same file? Well, yep, to me it is. I am more than happy to have, uh, you know, mono monotone version, grayscale version, color version. That's absolutely fine. And depending on your color management settings, you can even have RGB versus CMYK versus Pantone. Uh, it does take a bit of um, color management, obviously, but you can combine these things as well if you want to. Now, the thing is, I have a logo. And what's one of the things that you have when you want to place a logo? Now, first of all, when the logo is vector and you go to Photoshop and you want to place that logo here in Photoshop, what do you do? Now, when I ask this question to 100 people in a room, and I am in a room with 100 people occasionally, 
um, there seems to be a consensus where ba people basically say, well, I'm just going to do this. I'm going to copy it over. I'm going to hit the paste button and then choose smart objects because what else is there? Okay. Why, why would I ever choose any other option if I can choose smart object? Well, if I change the question and say, why would you paste that same artwork into InDesign? I kind of tend to lose half the room there. People say, well, you know, I want to link the logo all of a sudden. Why? Why would you then link? What changed? Actually, nothing changed, which doesn't mean you should be copying and pasting because the answer is, and well, the answer, my personal preference would be, I would link that as well. Logos are sacred. We all, we all know it's always sacred. Like you have this style guide and it's all built around the logo, right? So you cannot mess around with the... Uh, uh, with the width and height or the proportions or the colors or the padding around it or where it is or how you use it or what day of the week it is. So it, it is, there's so many rules with logos that we tend to think it's fine just to copy and paste stuff into InDesign where you have the problem that you can disproportionately uh, change or transform the logo without you knowing it that it might have conflicts for with different colors. Uh, it might, the black might give you issues with overprint. I've had all these issues happen to me for real in the past. So that can all go wrong. And here in Photoshop, yes, I could copy and paste the logo as a smart object. If I do that, I hit copy, I go here, I hit paste, I choose smart object. You know, I perfectly understand all of the benefits of a vector smart object because it's embedded, first of all, and you can double click it and it's going to go back to Illustrator and voila, you're changing the logo. Well, you can make local changes if you want to, which is absolutely fine. Again, this is not me saying do not use this method. I'm just saying there are other methods where maybe worth exploring, you know, and then given a certain scenario, it's up to you to make the decision because now you have more and better arguments to make a decision, okay? And not just something that you click out of habit. Now, let's take an alternative route here. So I love linking stuff. Now, why do I like linking stuff? Simply because it's safe, it's easy, it doesn't uh, bloat my Photoshop document. And if I build a package, yes, you can build a package in Photoshop, you use file package. It gets packaged as a separate AI file, which means if somebody ever asks, hey, can you send me the logo you used in Photoshop? And you go like, ugh, I don't have the original file anymore. I have to unembed the one I have in Photoshop. Again, circumstances change, bang, you have a lot more work to do just to kind of quickly send the logo, okay? Now, what do I do? First of all, I like to change the size of my artboard based on my style guide. Now, you might be thinking, what does an artboard have to do with my style guide and my corporate guidelines? The answer is padding. Now, what we always do is we have a logo and then we say, you know what, like there should be padding. And we always make up this, let's be honest, sometimes a bit of a ridiculous rule like, oh, like the logo, the padding should be one fifth of the height of this little tent. And then we have to you know, try and and um, uh, uh, figure out like if we have enough padding, yes or no. And that's kind of thing. And if you were to just basically copy and paste this logo, like, like I pitched here before, you know, and then if you're like, okay, so how much padding do you need? Like how much does this logo need to stay away from the text? Like, I'm pretty sure you guys are all doing what I used to do. It's like, I'm gonna put it here and then go like with the sheet, like one, two, three, four, five. You kind of count it, like to kind of get get that padding from the edge, which is not what I want to do here. I don't want to go like one, two, three, like kind of whisper to myself. Um, that's not what I want to do. I'm just gonna go ahead because I have auto select layer on. Let's quickly get rid of that here. Now, plan B, the padding is the artboard. That's the rule. Plan, the padding is the artboard. And now with this here, I'm gonna go back to Photoshop. I'm gonna choose file place linked. I'm going to link a file just like I do with Adobe InDesign. I'm going to go back here. I'm going to go into my Adobe Live um, website folder imports. And here I have my logo. I'll choose place. And now I get to choose which one I would like to place, which is great. You know, now at least I have a choice. And before I place anything, I'm going to go ahead and change the cropping from bounding to media box and bang, here's my padding. So I'm going to choose that same logo. I'll choose OK. And now look, here it is, here's the padding. I can go ahead and place the logo. I'm gonna be absolutely sure that I stay away from the text here, just like my corporate guidelines predict. Now you might say, but the padding is gone because I hit enter or return. That's very true. But if I hit command T or control T to transform, there's the padding again. 
The pattern is always there when you transform, but it's not part of the geometry. I can load a selection. It will load the artwork, not the padding, not the, the bounds of that particular artboard. This is going to help me, okay? Which is great. And there's so there's like a couple of ways to get your vector artwork basically from Illustrator here into Photoshop. If I do the exact same thing here, let's go to this one here, Stories. So here in Stories, let's take a look at, let's say this little heart icon. So let's say I'm gonna take this heart icon and I'm gonna use this in Photoshop. However, again, we tend to do this. We tend to paste as a smart object. Why? Because we want to use Illustrator's unique editing capabilities to edit the logo, blah, 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 which is fine, which is great. However, do I really need Illustrator's unique editing capabilities for this? No, because this is basically shape one, shape two, shape three. There are no complex blends, no masks, no patterns, no art brushes. There's nothing here that makes this truly a unique Illustrator case. Okay, again, this is not wrong. It's not wrong at all. But if I place the artwork in here knowing that I want to change this in Photoshop, I don't want to necessarily launch Illustrator like this, this Mastodon of a, of, a, of a program just so I can go like fill color green. Like that's not really you know what I want to do. I want to go, I want to be faster here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just go ahead and delete this. Go back to Illustrator, copy, paste it. And I'm going to chase, uh, paste this here as layers. So this is relatively new. So you have the ability to paste this as native Photoshop layers. Now you might be thinking, why not paste it as a shape layer? I could, however, the problem is it will paste this as one shape layer and a shape layer only has one color. That's not what I wanted. Because of that, paste it as layers. This is what I get. Now, there's only one thing that does happen. And that is if you paste it as a uh, layer is you'll get a folder. And then sometimes you might get a subfolder in here. You might have to clean this up a little bit. In this case, it's absolutely fine because my artwork is simple enough. And now as you can see, I've got three, three different layers here. This is a little uh, heart shine. This is the heart and this is the circle. Let's name these layers. First one was the shine. Don't hit return, hit the tab key, move to the next layer. This is heart, tab, circle and hit return to confirm. Just a little tip here for you guys. And now it's just a matter of double clicking and then choosing the color that you want. This is super easy. And now I have the flexibility I wanted of getting that artwork across. Again, this is about making choices in your workflow. How do you want to get your artwork from one app into the other? And what level of control do I want to maintain once the artwork has been placed, linked, embedded, whatever it is? Based on that, are you expecting any changes? Yes or no? How big is the artwork? Based on all this criteria, you will be able to basically make a better decision, a better educated decision. It's that simple. Okay. And those are all the things that I, I like in the book as well. Like that's all the stuff I try to convey. Think of, think before what you do, and it just shows you that there are a lot more options available. And again, there's there's no real right or wrong. It's more about more flexible or less flexible. That is basically the trade-off that you're making, okay? Based on how many extra clicks you have and when you're working with something, that's uh, that's basically it. Cool. It's a really helpful framework to think backwards and you know start with um, how you're going to solve for that. So absolutely, I think um, there's a lot of comments in the chat here too, especially um, with that built-in padding, just like, boom, of course, like I have to try this out. Um, and some jokes around uh, how how much that padding is. Stuart says, it's a fifth of the flame. <laughs> Sandra says, it's two thirds of a four long and Sean says, three whales long. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've, I've had this with like, I, I worked for a lot of different companies and uh, not because I got fired all the time, but simply because I was, um, I was a freelancer. I, I was placed at different different art studios, and um, mm -hmm. and it, it was like that. Like, oh, you have the logo, and it's like uh, you take a third of the height of the letter P, and it's like five five little P's like on the right, and I go like, oh, and I have to measure it with like this yeah. this rectangle without a without a stroke or a fill. I'm like, oh, guys, this is not helping. This is not helping. This does help, hopefully. Okay, so just uh, give this uh, give this a go, you guys. Cool. Um, now let's uh, let's do one more thing here. So let's uh, let's let's take a look at what time is it? It's one. Okay. We have about twenty minutes left. We have twenty and... minutes left. Okay. 
let's do let's do something crazy here. Let's take a look at InDesign content, and um, let's put InDesign content in Photoshop. Now there are two questions that people think of when I say let's put InDesign content in Photoshop. The first question is why? Why would you ever do that? And the second question should probably be how do you even do that? Because mm -hmm. if you take a look at any Photoshop file, this is a Photoshop file. It's opened up in, in uh, as we just an InDesign file. Let's open this up here in Photoshop. It doesn't work. If I choose File Place, it doesn't work. How do you do this? Well. Let's start with the why, okay? That's really important. Now, I like building mockups when I used to design something. So I, I believe you know you can build a packaging, which is nice, uh, but what you uh, what you send to someone in the end, what you send to your customer in the end for approval and comments and feedback, is this like this unfolded flat version of your package with like folding lines and and glue lines or stitching lines and. And then your customer might say, okay, I, I think I can kind of imagine what it might look like. Like same yeah. with the poster, it's like, here's the PDF. And, and then they would, whatever, they would look look at that massive poster PDF on a tiny device or, or with a generic view. Anyway, the thing is you wanna give them part of the experience and you mm -hmm. only have have one, one way of doing that. It's that simple. And for that, I love building a mockup. So let's take a look at a, at a, a simple example here. So I, um, I built a, fictional product. So let's do this here. It's a, it's a food pouch. And um, let's just take this one here. It's again, it's a fictional thing. Let's just imagine this is what needs to be printed on that little pouch. And that little pouch uh, looks like this. This is a stock image that I found on Adobe stock. And let's imagine that this design is what I would normally send to the printer. This is what I would also send to my to my customer to get approval, to get comments and, you know, but they don't really know like where are like these little uh, little um, like little cutting lines like this little edge here like where is it going to manifest in this design like is this little folded line here is this going to uh, come or overlap with for example what I have here is going to come over this little quality label yes you know I'm not quite sure so the thing is I could just you know send this off to my customer and that's fine that's what we've always done however I like to kind of um, accommodate that a little bit with like an action shot. Now, a couple of things. Why would you do this in InDesign? Why would you do anything in InDesign to get into Photoshop? InDesign does certain things very, very well, okay? One of those things is text. So the, the text editing capabilities, the typesetting capabilities of InDesign are unmatched in Creative Cloud. And so because of that, it's also easy for me to, for example, um, build something this for my packaging, right? This is just a regular, you know, table, it's an InDesign table. And uh, I would just, you know, do this and it, it's a table, right? Now, if I were to need something like this in Photoshop for a graphic like this here, if I were to recreate this in Photoshop, so I want to have the exact same visual and I need to have the ability to still change the text. So I, I cannot just take a screenshot, okay? How many layers would this take me? The answer is 5,000. It's a lot of layers. So this is not this would not be your best day having to recreate this in Photoshop. It's not it's not the best tool for this for this job. But Photoshop obviously excels in other things. So why don't you just build an InDesign and then bring it in Photoshop? Okay, so we know why. We kind of start to get why when I do this. But the question is how. The answer is libraries. Libraries in Creative Cloud have the ability to do things that traditional offline workflows place an Illustrator file in InDesign, place a Photoshop file in InDesign, place an Illustrator file in Photoshop. These native file formats, these traditional offline workflows, they cannot keep up with what the CC libraries can do, okay? And depending on the use case, CC libraries would be a better, a better way of doing these things. So what you can do is the following. I'm gonna go ahead and just create a new uh, library. I'm going to call this one. I'm just going to type in whatever um, Adobe Live, for example. I'll choose Create because I create this here. This means that here in Photoshop, if I go and choose Library, it's open. But where is it? There you go. If I go here, it says Adobe Live, and same thing in Illustrator and, and Premiere Pro and After Effects and anyway, everywhere basically. Okay. Now the only thing I need to do is just take my design. 
Okay, so it has linked images and everything, and just basically go ahead and just add this as a graphic. So this is gonna copy, copy, copy the artwork here into the library. So if I if I double click this here, it's gonna open up this copy in its source application, which in this case is InDesign. Okay, if I make a change, if I, whatever, like if I rotate this logo a bit like so, and then move it there, and then save it. You're gonna see this one update as well. There you go. I just now updated the artwork here. It did not update the version here. Again, I am working here on a library item. You can drag and drag a copy and, and update it. There are ways of keeping this in sync, just so you know, but that's kind of beyond the scope of what we're doing here today. Now, the cool thing is now nothing is stopping me from basically saying, you know what? I'm gonna just activate this layer mask that I have. I also pre-added a blur effect. And uh, I'm gonna go into Adobe Live I'm gonna drag and drop this in here and choose okay. I'm gonna put this on top of the layer. I am going to put this on multiply to get rid of all of the white here. Now, if you're not quite sure what am I, what is I'm doing and it's going way too fast, this is being recorded guys, just so you know. And now I'm just gonna go ahead and just load a selection. Again, I did prepare this a little bit. I'm gonna apply a layer mask and now I have this, which is fine, it's fine, but I want the highlights to shines through my InDesign design. I'm gonna double click here to open up the layer styles and hold down the alter option key and drag this slider inwards just to kind of get these highlights to come through. This is exactly what I want. I'm gonna choose okay, this is pretty good. And now based on that, I can just go back and then scale this up and down and whatever it is I wanna do, you just kind of have like a bit of an estimate just to kind of place this graphic uh, on here. Now, obviously I can keep going. I can say, you know what, I'm gonna do this again, like once more and do this here. And again, this one should be also on multiply. Oop, there we go. And again, same thing. I have a different mask for this one. You can keep going, going, et cetera, until you're kind of done with that. However, I could also go back to InDesign and for example, take this table, save the table as a graphic. And I'm gonna place very, very um, strange words. I'm gonna place the InDesign table in Photoshop. Plus here, this is gonna be representing the back of the packaging, same thing. Multiply, let's add a layer mask. Again, it's a path. I already have that path lying around. I did this before. There you go. So now I have something like this here and I can even, if I wanted to keep going, I can even say, you know what? I'm gonna add a uh, whatever, uh, um, gradients or a fill layer. Let's just choose a basic fill color for now. I'm just gonna, uh, do this, just the basic color. I am going to uh, duplicate. Yes, there we go. Again, this should be multiply or again, you just go ahead and, and work, work with that with those things here. And now you have a way of just recoloring this any way that you want, something like this here. And the cool thing is like, this is not really legible. I do realize this, but this is just, it's just a layer. So I can go ahead and for example, say this should be a color overlay, for example, here. Um, actually, no, I can't. I was just improvising a bit here. No, it's gonna take the full thing. No, it's fine. It's fine. I can um, improvise with this, but I'm not gonna spend any time on this, but you can change the um, uh, the color of the individual items here. I'm just gonna uh, just lighten the color a bit just for the sake of time for the moment in that case, there you go. So the thing is, this is now all linked, right? So what you can do is you can always go back and say, you know what, I'm gonna right click and I'm gonna just edit this if I want to. So you can choose edit from here. It will open this up in its original source document. And let's uh, let's change this up here. For example, like, uh, you know, let's change the calories. It's um, 640 calories. Let's, uh, let's change that a bit. So I just changed all the data in, in this particular file, in this particular table here. So again, you can just add lines, remove lines. It's a table. You close it and you go back and it did change this now here live in Photoshop. So mm -hmm. you have you have the ability of, of adding these different things here directly from InDesign into Photoshop. There is a use for this. It really, really is. And it's not maybe something you might be using every single day, but it's important for you guys just to know that this exists. I mean, this is out there, okay? Which is, which is exactly why, why this is happening. Oh, that's right. Yeah, now I think I remember. 
Uh, let's take a look here. Yeah, the reason why it filled the entire table with a, a fill color is simply because I uh, made the decision that this should all have a background color in the table. That is the reason why. So if I remove those colors and then, oops, double click here, there we go. So if I take this here, that's the reason why it filled it up. Oh, I just had to think quickly there for a second and it just didn't come to mind why that was. So let's take a look here. See, now it's going to be transparent. And now I can go back and then choose. There we go. This looks friendly. As you can see here, I can now go back and change it. This is what I wanted. That's great. I can always go back. It's going to change your opacity, whatever you want to do. So I even like recolored this InDesign artwork. And it's now white while it was linked. And it was black. And it comes from InDesign. It's in Photoshop. And it's whole different world out there all of a sudden. So these are all the things that you can do. And you might be thinking, well, why can't I just use a PDF? Well, you could use a PDF. You can make a PDF from InDesign and then place it into Photoshop and then place it. But then the problem is, again, it's about flexibility. It's about anticipation. Your customer will ask you for changes. We all, this is like absolute truth, right? Customers ask for changes. When you make that change, create a new PDF, recreate the PDF, hoping that you use the same preset, the same settings, same resolution, everything else, and then replace the one you have here. It's fine, it's possible. I used to do it a lot, okay, for posters and all that kind of stuff. However, it does allow you to have a bit more flexibility here in this particular case here. And you can keep going. So for example, if I just open up a different file, just as a last project here, because I think that we are running out of time. Uh, for example, if I take uh, this one, this is a, a mockup I downloaded off Adobe Stock. Um, this is a bit much, the reflection. Like this is a mockup from Adobe Stock. Um, look, let's uh, let's do this here. Let's uh, let's take a look at that uh, travel ad that I had here. So let's. Um, do I still have that open? By the way, do I still have it? No. No. Yes, I do. Here it is. So let's do this here. Let's just take all this stuff and let's just add this here as a graphic. There we go. And let's add all this stuff. And again, let's add this as a graphic. Again, this is just for mockup purposes, right? Now we can go back here to uh, Photoshop. I'm gonna double click the smart object to open it up. I'll choose okay. And now it's just a matter of saying, you know what? I'm gonna place this linked. I like right clicking, not just clicking and dragging because that way I have total control over the option that is picked for me, linked versus embedded. Look, if you save that now, if you go back, here it is, here's my poster. And I just get to add a bit of reflection here if I want to, and that's basically it. And now if your customer wants to change to a different one, you go back here and you have to change it, right? So what do you do? See the little cloud icon? That means it's a linked cloud layer. If you right click that, you can choose this option, relink to library graphic. Now I'm gonna click that. Now look at my layers panel, sorry, my, 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 uh, my libraries panel. Look what happens if I click that. It says select a graphic to relink. Okay. I'm gonna choose island hopping and choose relink. It relinks it with the same graphic, same positioning, nothing changes. You simply save it and you go back and now it changes this um, this file here. Now, one last thing, what if you wanna make changes? What if you wanna try something else? What if you wanna change the source document? Well, you could, for example, go back here and you're gonna double click it. It opens it up in its source document, which is InDesign. Again, we're opening up the copy that was embedded here inside of the library, right? You can do island hopping, uh, whatever, mountain, mountain hopping, whatever it is that you want to do. There we go. Or let's just do, uh, let's do this. Let's just do like Adobe Live. Let's do that. Save it. You can see it has now updated. I'm going to close it. So let's go back to Photoshop and nothing happens. The reason nothing happens is where is that one little layer with the cloud icon? Where is it? Is it in this composition? I don't see it. It's not here. That's the reason it's not updating. It can only trigger or, or sense an update or offer you to update something if the live link is exposed and the live link was the cloud layer. The cloud layer was not in here, right? The cloud layer was in here in the smart object. Double click it. Now I'm exposing that live link layer where it says that there is an update available. So the only thing you do is you go ahead and you update the modified content 
it will update now. Now you save and you return and you've got that update. So just something to to be to be careful of, okay? Because you might change. You're like, where is the update going? It's not, you know. And the thing is, you can nest as much as you want. Like you can put, uh, a, uh, you can nest a file in Photoshop, and you can nest it or link that in Illustrator and place it in InDesign, and then save the Illustrator artwork in the library and then place that in Photoshop. And if you want, you can place that Photoshop file back in InDesign for something else. So you you got this deep link, like a little babushka doll, right? There's like one doll and the other <laughs> doll. And so you can keep going basically. And the thing is, if you ever trigger an update, like a little domino brick that you toss over and it's gonna have an impact on everything else that follows or it's linked to it, you have to open up all the steps and do yes, link, yes, link, yes, link. It cannot update the link um, automatically when the file is closed. So you need to expose that file, you need to expose those layers to have that update here. And again, that's like one example of um, of the same method. There you go. Yeah, that's that's really helpful. And there's a lot of um, community members in the chat saying that's how it's done. Great stream from Stuart. Um, Angus says brilliant. Um, originally, Stuart said the the PDF route, but this is a great hack um, that you were sharing earlier. Um, we have one uh, quick question from Sandrine uh, who says, would you copy the same smart objects so when you change one, all the other packaging changes? I think this was back to the packaging example you were sharing. Oh, yeah. Okay. So um, that's a good question. So basically, this is, it's a linked, uh, it, it is a linked smart object. Actually, no, it's a cloud smart object. This is how I would describe it. So this means if you were to uh, duplicate it, I'm hitting Command J or Control J on the keyboard. So this is my my second version. I'm gonna just quickly just um, hide the masks for a second. There you go. So ugh, this is not really looking like anything. I'm just gonna hide everything else. I don't need this, I don't need this. I'm just gonna get rid of the, um, the blending for a sec, just so you can kind of see what's going on. There you go. So I've got um, two exact copies, right, Sandrine? So this is the one on the left, one on the right. So these are both, it's just a copy, or one, or one copy. So if I were to double click this one and make a change, for example, I'm going to do this. I am going to just select a, whatever, orange. Let's make this orange, orangey. There we go. If I save this, it looks horrible. Anyway, if I save this now, what I'm actually updating is the library. Okay, it's the library item, which means if I go back, they will both update. They do not both update because it is a duplicated smart object. They're both updating because they're both linking to the same source here. This is, it's similar to duplicating a smart object and updating one. However, there's a step in between. And that is that um, these smart objects, the contents of these individual smart objects is linked to the library. While with a traditional smart object, the content tends to be embedded in the layer. Now, as we are on the subject of smart object, by the way, if I could just delete these things here, just know that if you have any smart object, so let's say, for example, just to kind of finish this off, just a quick tip here. So if you have a simple layer that looks like this, and there's another layer uh, that looks like this, for example, okay? So if you take both layers, both layers here, and if you were to convert these to a smart object, so this is what you get, smart object, right? If you duplicate that layer, so you've got two versions of the same smart objects, like you said, Sandrine, if you double click one of them and you make a change to one of, you know, one of these instances, let's, let's say this is now green and you save it and you close it, yes, it will update both. However, that's not always what you want. What you can do is, not just hit Command J or duplicate. If you right click and you choose here for um, new smart object via copy, that's different. It doesn't seem different, but it is different. This one is excluded of all changes. Look, in theory, if I were to double click the same smart object, any one of three and make a change, make a change here, for example, let's just say I'm just gonna change this one now. Okay, now normally if I save it, go back, all three should update, right? This is the expectation, all, only two update. When you right click a smart object and you choose new smart object, new smart object via copy, you're creating a smart object, but he's the king of its own kingdom. So which means he will be um, independent. It's still a smart object, okay? But it's independent of the other smart objects, okay? It's like starting a, a, a second flow of smart objects. 
So this is how you duplicate a smart object because sometimes a few people get kind of trapped in the smart object because they've got one and they duplicate them a couple of times, which is great. And then they need one that needs to be a little bit different and they don't, and, and, and they're, they're afraid that if they change one, they might affect the other one that needs to be a bit different. So they just rasterize it or they undo it or they do something else just to kind of keep it out of the line of fire basically when you make those changes. Right clicking and choosing smart object via layer copy, that is the way to do that. Okay, I'm hoping that answered your, uh, your question. Yes, absolutely. So um, the, the chat says thank you um, and thank you for clarifying that for Sandrine. And uh, Angus says, excellent stream. Please come back, Bart. I hope you come back. <laughs> and um, Stuart agrees. Right, This is right up there, Bart. Bart. Dave says, great session. Thank you. I can't wait um, to check out your book. And um, Sandrine also said, thanks. I learned about the difference with new SM via copy only recently. Having that choice was incredibly helpful for the kind of work I do. Smart object. That's great. Um, so... And, uh, and just so you know, the person that guessed the CS3 correct gets a, a free ebook version um, of, of my book. So I hope you'll enjoy that. That will be our very own Tim. So he was the only one to, to guess it correctly. And oh, there were okay. some, some, some jokes in the chat of oh, like a Christmas wine, a ham or. <laughs> <laughs> that would be um, nice be though. Great. That would be nice. It'll... I have a ham lying around here somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. That sounds great. That sounds great. So this was brilliant. Thank you so much, Bart, um, for sharing this with us. And before we wrap up, um, how can community members check out your book? What's the best way to get in touch if they have more questions? Uh, okay. Um, well, uh, if you have any questions, so you can find me on, on various social media. So I'm obviously on LinkedIn. You can find me on Twitter and I'm also on Instagram. Um, and if you want to learn more about the book, it's available now. So you can get it on Amazon or, you know, I, I know that it's now just recently come out. So the bookstore might not have it yet, but I know that like, as we speak, like copies are being sent across, um, you know, the, the U S and, and Europe. Uh, so you can definitely get it from there. So maybe it's a good idea for a Christmas present. Who knows? Even if it's just for yourself. Absolutely. And we'll be sure to post the link uh, to the book in the chat as well. But Bart, thank you so much um, for joining us today. It was an absolute pleasure to reconnect and see all the incredible things that you're working on. This was fun. Thanks for having me. And thank you to everyone who tuned in today. Um, we have some great streams also coming up. So you can join us again tomorrow, where we'll be focusing on indie book publishing with Femi Osewa. And Tony Harmer is our host. And then on Wednesday, we also have surreal visual effects for music videos with guest Rupert Holler and our host will be our very own Joe, Joe Allen. So be, first, be sure to check it out and join us on behance.net slash live. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.
Thank you.